Good evening. You might take out your Bibles and open them to James chapter 1. James chapter 1. We're going to spend most of our time in that opening, so you might place a marker there when you find it. It's good to be here tonight. Good to be with everyone that's here. As Nathan mentioned, we're missing several. We've got some that are sick. Bonnie's home not feeling well as well. Uh, so let's remember them in our prayers and been thinking about them, taking their names before our God. James chapter 1. Beginning there in verse 21, the Bible says, Therefore, putting aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness and humility, receive the word implanted, which is able to save your souls. But prove yourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. The one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this man will be blessed in what he does. If anyone thinks himself to be religious, and yet does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this man's religion is worthless. Pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is this to visit orphans and widows in their distress, and to keep oneself unstained from the world. There are a lot of people today use that word religion in a very negative context. Matter of fact, a lot of people might tell you that they're spiritual, but not religious. And if you ask them why or what they have against religion or being religious, they might take you back to a passage like Matthew chapter 15, where Jesus rebukes the Pharisees for giving too much credence to their man-made traditions and not enough credence to the important things of the law. And they'll tell us this is the problem with religion. And when they talk about religion, they're often talking about just that, those man-made traditions that different religious bodies have put into place that are, in a lot of instances, what separates them from other religious bodies And they're rightly seeing a problem with that. Unfortunately, what you often see is they take that a step too far. And basically the church itself becomes one of those structures in their mind. And suddenly if there's any rules, if there's any regulation, that's the kind of religion that we shouldn't appeal to that God condemns. They're spiritual, but not religious. You know, when you open your Bible and begin to read in passages like James chapter 1, I I think make it very clear, the Bible does not condemn religion. Instead, what the Bible tells us is how we might practice religion properly, how we might practice our religion in a way that actually pleases the Lord. And as we begin to look at a passage like James 1 and maybe listen to our friends or neighbors as they talk about religion as a negative thing, It becomes obvious that James is talking about something different from what they are talking about. That when James talks about religion, he's not talking about man-made traditions or structures that are built around the Word of God. He's talking about something much more elementary, much more foundational and principal to our life with God, I would suggest to you, and I found this the other day, I thought it was a very good way of explaining what James is talking about. This author said religion is the external, observable qualities of the life of faith in Christ. Now, we could talk about that within the context of our worship and the structure of our worship and what we do and what we do not participate in in regards to our worship. We could talk about that, I believe. In, in the context of the work of the church. And I think we could, could describe something very valid and important there as religion, not the man-made ideas, but what we find the Bible prescribing for the church to do. But that's not who James is talking to. James, we always make this point when we go to the book of James, don't we? That it's very practical. It's a practical examination of faith in the life of an individual. In the section we just read, beginning there in verse 21, where he talks about putting aside all filthiness and wickedness, and instead in humility receive the word implanted, which is able to save your souls. That's exactly what he's talking about, isn't it? 
It's an individual's faith. It's an individual's walk in relationship with God that James has under consideration. And in that context, he gives us a contrast in verse 26 and 27 between vain or worthless religion in verse 26 and pure and undefiled religion in verse 27. I think it's very important for us as we're reading through the book of James, and we could go to other passages, but as we're reading through the book of James, it's important for us to understand that our religion matters because our religion is the practice of our faith. Our religion is very much how we walk with God, and Scripture does not appeal to ambiguous, undefinable statements like spiritual but not religious in order to talk about the heart of faith. Instead, what Scripture does, and we notice this all the time, don't we, is the Scripture lays out patterns of the work and the worship of the church. Scripture lays out. This happened to my iPad during the song service, and I thought I wasn't going to have a sermon, but okay, we're back. Scripture lays out God's plan and purpose for us. And what this does, and and what I'm hoping we can can do in our own lives after this, is what this does is it gives us these very clear, very obvious markers where we can look at our life and we can say, okay, am I walking as I should? Is my religion vain or is my religion pure and undefiled? And of course, what we'll be hoping for is that pure and undefiled religion. Something I want to point out, and I think this should be very obvious, just from the little section of text that we read just now, is that religion that does not shape behavior is vain religion. I want you to notice verse 26. At first glance, it might seem somewhat odd what this verse says. If anyone thinks himself to be religious and yet does not bridle his tongue but deceives his own heart, this man's religion is worthless. Why why is he comparing our religion to our speech or to the use of our tongue? Well, you know, coming out of what he said there in verse 21 and verse 19 and 20, he's talking about anger. In verse 20 and 21, he's talking about putting away filthiness and wickedness, those things which are sinful. And then he comes and he gives us a very specific example of an area in our life where we need to be very careful. As a matter of fact, if you go on and read chapter 3, The first part of chapter 3 is going to deal with this very idea that the tongue is something that needs to be bridled and turns around and says, no man can. But what do you find out just a couple of verses after that? The heart is the issue. But what has to be changed, what has to be reshaped is the heart because the tongue draws from the resource that is the heart. And so what James is telling us, I think he's using a specific example to lay out a very broad principle here. And that is that if you claim to be religious and yet your heart is not changed, then your religion or your claim to religion is worthless. You are not walking with God. You are not walking in faith. Religion that does not shape behavior is vain religion. Instead, we notice in verse 27, The pure and undefiled religion is religion that does. It's an expression of obedient faith. And again, it's not just some mental assent. It's something that's that's demonstrated in true action in real life, right? So he talks about caring and visiting for orphans and widows in their distress, but he doesn't stop there, does he? He comes right back to that idea from verse 21, to keep oneself unstained by the world. Pure and undefiled religion shapes behavior. I want us to understand that at the very outset as we begin this study because I think it's very fundamental to everything else that we're going to notice tonight. Now let's go back to James chapter 1. Let's look earlier in the passage and let's go back to verse 1. James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the twelve tribes who were dispersed abroad, greetings. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect result, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. But if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to you. 
And one of the things I believe that James is pointing out here is that our trials, our, our moments of tribulation, our, our times of suffering, they give us unique opportunities to practice this pure and undefiled religion. How are we going to deal with those difficult moments? How are we going to deal with the pain that they bring into our lives? And the way that we choose, the path that we choose to take in those difficult times will tell us, it will give us a very clear marker, do, am I practicing pure and undefiled religion or do I have a worthless religion? Someone says, well, how will I know? Who do you turn to in your time of trial? Do you turn toward God or do you turn away from God? If you're turning toward God, then there's a great indicator that you're practicing a pure and undefiled religion. If you turn away from God and turn to the world, well, go listen to the sermon this morning and you'll see all the problems with that, right? But it's certainly a vain and worthless religion that you're practicing. Notice what he says there in verse 5. This is in that context of suffering. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. He's going to talk again in chapter 3 about godly wisdom, chapter 3, and there in verse 15, he's contrasting worldly wisdom and godly wisdom. He starts with worldly wisdom in verse 15. This wisdom is not that which comes down from above, but is earthly, natural, and demonic, where jealousy and selfish ambition exist. There is disorder in every evil thing, but the wisdom from above is first pure, and then peaceable, and gentle, and reasonable, and full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering without hypocrisy. And the seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. So James says when, we're, when we are in those times of suffering and trial, that what we need to do is we need to turn to God and ask God for wisdom. And of course, this isn't talking about God reaching down and putting His finger in our head and changing how we think. What he's talking about here is the Word of God and what the Word of God does for us. Didn't we notice that principle this morning? When Lot was standing outside the door and the men from every quarter of the city of Sodom were coming to him and demanding that he hand over the two angels that were in his house, and, and Lot made that terrible offer. Take my daughters instead. And what was the point that we made? The solution to his problem had already been provided and he just didn't realize it, right? Because it's when he went inside the house and the angel struck everyone blind, the whole situation dissipated. Here Lot's making this, this terrible, terrible decision, this terrible offer, when God had already promised or provided his solution. Brother, how often in time of trial, when we, when we really open our hearts to God, when we really turn to him in faith, how often do we realize he's already given us the answer that we need? Do you read the book of Proverbs regularly? I love the way the book of Proverbs is laid out. Have you ever noticed how when you're going through the book of Proverbs, it seems like it gets kind of repetitive in sections? Like maybe you're in the middle of the book of Proverbs and you start thinking, wait a minute, I read some of these things, some of these principles were expressed in the first part of Proverbs, and then you get to the end and you're like, hey, wait a minute, I've already read this at least twice. Why is there this repetition? I think it follows the cycle of life. Have you ever noticed how you end up in the same problems again and again and again? And there's God's book of wisdom, and it's following right behind you. It's just waiting for you to turn to it. The answer, the solution, how do I deal with this trial? How do I deal with this difficulty? It's there. God's already provided it. And what we need to do is we need to turn to God prayerfully, and we need to ask for His wisdom. We need to open our hearts and our minds to Him. The wisdom we need has already been provided. It's available. You know what trials do for us is they remind us that we don't have the answers, don't they? Because that, that's what we're doing when we're in a trial and we're crying out and we're saying to everybody we meet, I don't know what to do. I, I don't know what the solution is. Sometimes I think what we need is just hear ourselves, Because what we're actually saying is I don't have the strength. I don't have the power. I'm too weak. I need to turn to God and seek that solution. Trials should cause us to humble ourselves. Trials should cause us to lean upon the Lord. And you know, I, I think this is a very interesting idea to consider 
when we talk about prayer, you know, how often do we make these prayers? And I know we talk about this from time to time. But how often when we pray, and I'm talking about our personal prayers to God, how often do we pray and we give God a list of requests? Now somebody says, well, the Bible does say to make your supplications known to God, and, and certainly it does. But how often are we just trying to get God to do things for us in our prayer? And how often are we just turning to Him and expressing the fact that we're not capable? You ever go through the Psalms and read how a lot of those prayers in the book of Psalms, a lot of times they begin this way, sometimes the whole Psalm is nothing but extolling the greatness of God. It's the psalmist just talking about how great and how powerful and how wonderful God is. Do you pray that way? Do, do you ever think to pray that way? Do you ever pray a prayer and not ask for something? Just thank God for everything? Or, or just tell God, I, I, see, I see who you are? The psalmist did. The psalmist did. Let me tell you what that does. That humbles you. That humbles you. You know, if all my prayers are, are a list of requests, I don't know that that's very humbling. Because we might start to get this idea that I've got somebody in my corner that's just waiting to operate on my behalf and I don't have to worry about certain things because after all, I can just ask and I receive and it's all good. I think that's a very dangerous way to look at God, a very dangerous way to look at prayer. It's certainly not the pattern we see when we read prayers. Are there requests? Sure, there are requests. We studied one just the other night in Ephesians chapter 3. But so often what prayer is, is an expression of the petitioner's weakness and an expression of the glory and the power and the wonder of God. And brethren, those are humbling prayers to pray. It, it certainly that's the kind of praying that we need to do. You know, we were just in James chapter 3 and we, re, we were reading about that wisdom of God. And you know, as, as you begin to think about verse 17, the wisdom from above is pure, peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy, good fruits, unwavering, without hypocrisy. You know, if you just begin to think about God and God's wisdom and these characteristics of God's wisdom and then compare yourself to that, can you read that verse and say you're always that way? Because I can't. Let me tell you something. That's humbling. That's humbling. Why do I get myself into some of the positions I get myself in? Maybe it's because I'm not these things. Maybe because this doesn't describe my character, at least in the moment. Which means what? I'm not using God's wisdom. I'm not using God's wisdom, and I need to be humbled. I need to be reminded what the prophet said in Jeremiah chapter 10. And there in verse 23, I know, O Lord, the way of a man is not in himself, nor is it in a man who, direct, who walks to direct his own steps. I need to turn to the Lord in humble dependence upon him. And let's go back over to James chapter 1, and this is so important. Half measures are dangerous. Matter of fact, we might say half measures kill. Right? Notice there in verse 6, chapter 1, He must ask in faith without any doubting. For the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For that man ought not to expect that he will receive anything from the Lord, being a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. There's a story in 2 Kings chapter 22. Jehoshaphat and Ahab, they're, they're joined together, they're united together, fighting against the Aramaeans, I believe it is. And Jehoshaphat turns to Ahab and he says, Ahab, is there not a prophet of the Lord that we can turn to? He wanted to know, is it time to go to battle or not? Is there not a prophet of the Lord we can turn to? And Ahab's answer is, uh, there is, but every time he says something, it's against me, so I don't talk to him. I have other prophets. <laughs> There's the double-minded man. I want to hear from God, but I only want to hear from God when God is going to tell me what I want to hear. And if He's not going to tell me what I want to hear, then I don't want to hear from God. I said 2 Kings 22. That's 1 Kings 22, by the way. I don't want to hear from God if He's not going to tell me what I want to do. 
That's the double-minded man, double-minded man who's unstable in all his ways. He admits that God is there. He admits that God has the prophet. He admits that there's wisdom from God. I just don't like what it says. He might tell me just to keep suffering. He might not make the suffering stop. He might tell me I caused my own suffering. I might not want to hear it. And so that man might pray to God, but that man doesn't pray to God seeking God's wisdom. That man might pray to God seeking his own way. Brethren, we have to come to God seeking salvation. We're owed nothing. You know, when you think about that, we're dead in our trespasses and sins. And it's by His grace that we're made alive, Ephesians chapter 2. How dare I recognize that? Appeal to God for His grace and mercy. But then try to hold back control of my own life for myself. Because that's what the double-minded man does. Friends, that's a worthless religion. That's a worthless religion. James does something very interesting in the middle of this section. Begin, we already read it there in verses 21 through 25. And what he shows us is that true religion demands the proper view of God's Word. And there's an interesting progression that takes place there. Notice in verse 21, we've already read it a couple, a couple of times. Therefore, putting aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness and humility, listen to this, receive the word implanted which is able to save your souls. Now what's interesting, you go back to verse 1 and it becomes pretty obvious that James is not writing to lost people. James is writing to people who have named the name of Christ. They're in a fellowship with God. And yet there's some, there's some problem, there's some struggle here, and, and James is addressing this. We, we've got to receive the word that's been implanted, which is able to save our souls. So we've got to receive the word, right? We've got to listen to what God says. And it seems that he's talking about the gospel because it's the word implanted. He's not talking about some innate characteristic in self. He's talking about something we've received from God and that something is able to save our souls. That's the gospel. So we've got to receive the gospel. We've got to listen to what God has said. But then he goes on beyond that, right? Verse 22. Prove yourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. So we've got to receive the word and then we've got to be doers of the word. It is not enough, James says, for me just to hear the gospel and then remain the same. James says that we must then become doers of the word. We noticed a minute ago, pure and undefiled religion shapes behavior, right? If I'm truly, if I truly have faith in God, I, I will, and that will be seen in a, a change in my action. I will do what the word tells me to do and then he strengthens that in verse 25 the one who looks intently at the perfect law the law of liberty and abides by it not having become a forgetful here but an effectual doer this man will be blessed in what he does so we started off lost in sins or needing to be saved have our souls saved in verse 21 and in verse 25 if we follow this progression we'll be blessed in what we do why well, this man will receive the word, right? He will listen to the wisdom of God. He will do the word. And that beautiful illustration, isn't it? If you don't, you're like a man that looks at yourself in the mirror and then walks away forgetting what kind of person you are, right? Some of you get to a certain age and that's the only thing you do with mirrors, right? You try to get away from them, forget what you saw. But it doesn't help you, does it? You don't change anything, do you? Well, of course not. Of course not. And if we're treating God's word that way, I know all of his wisdom's in there, but sometimes it makes me uncomfortable and it really calls me to action. And that action sounds like it's going to take a lot out of me. So I think I'm just going to, I think I'm just going to, to just keep going on, right? And I'll speak fondly of God's word, but I'm not interested in these changes that have to be made. James says, no, that's foolishness. 
That's foolish. That's worthless religion. That's the religion that does us no good. And then again, he strengthens that. And I, I, I like this transition here. He goes from the word to the law. He goes from word to law. The one who looks intently at the perfect law. The law of liberty and abides by it. Not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this man would be blessed in what he does. Now the word law there cannot refer to the old law because it's synonymous with that implanted word which is able to save your souls that's there in verse 21. He's talking about the gospel. He's talking about the gospel. You know, we mentioned that spiritual but not religious concept just a moment ago. James 1, 21 through 25, this progression completely destroys that. Because the idea in that spiritual but not religious, it, it's kind of the idea of, you know, I'm just going to be a good person, right? I, I've noticed something about the majority of the people I've heard use that phrase, and I'm not trying to be derogatory, I'm just being direct, okay? I, I've heard people use that phrase, and then you talk to them, and what you find out is they know just enough about, the God, about God's Word to be dangerous, right? That's kind of how I am in a lot of areas of life. Like, I know just enough about working on cars to completely destroy the entire car and make sure it never runs again. Just That's how much I know about it, right? Just enough to think maybe I can try that, right? And, and a lot of times, people who, who use these phrases, in my experience, that, that's about where their understanding of Scripture is. Right, they, They've read Matthew 7 and, and verse 1, and they know that we're not supposed to judge. And they've read over in 1 John chapter 4 that God is love. And they've read John 3, 16, and they know that God sent His Son so that we might have everlasting life. And, and they've kind of taken those, those handful of passages and, and you know, often absent any context, and they form a theology from that. Now, brother, that's about as dangerous a thing as you can possibly do. Cherry pick four or five passages that sound really nice and then build your view of God and service to God based on that. So we were talking about 200,000 errors in the New Testament this morning. Pat Googled it. There's 180,000 words in the New Testament. So, so there can't be 200,000 errors, but that's kind of interesting. Why is there 180,000 words in the New Testament if all we needed was four verses? Why, why God do that? And what happens, and again, I think these are well-intended people. I'm not trying to belittle them, but I want you to see the danger of their condition. They've taken this hand, these handful of verses, and there may be a couple of others, but they're going to be in that same vein. And they've created their own theology, and that theology ends up being something along the lines of, I'm not a bad person. You can't judge me, and God's going to save me because he's a gracious, loving God. James explodes that idea. James blows that up. James says, first of all, you're going to have to receive the word implanted. How much of it? Just the parts you like? Well, I think the first part of James 1 tore that up, didn't it? No, not, not just the ones we like. No, it's going gonna, it's gonna to have to change who I am. This reception will. Why? Because I have to become a doer of the Word. Again, not some ambiguous concept. Well, I'm a spiritual person. Define that for me. You ever ask somebody who says that? Well, I'm a spiritual person. Can you tell me what that means? Call me if you get an answer. Because I never have. I, I never have. You, you'll get some concept about being a good neighbor and being, being a loving person and all. Well, okay, but I, I know a lot of people that, that don't even believe there is a God who are all those things. So that's not being a spiritual person. What, what does this mean? James tells me that pure and undefiled religion is going to lead me to do what the Word says. And then he treats it as a law. Now that's interesting. He treats it as a law. Are laws optional? Not if it's actually a law. Doesn't mean much if it is. No, James says, listen, 
And we've got to do what the Lord's commanded us to do. This idea of I'm spiritual but not religious, it doesn't fit with any scriptural concept I can find of religion. And James, I think, makes that very clear to us. So over in James chapter 1 and there in verse 27, we see this phrase, visit the widows and orphans in their distress and keep oneself unstained by the world. And we go here a lot of times when, when we're debating people about the work of the church, don't we? And we talk about whether or not churches have the right to, to build orphans' homes and to build home for the care of, of those who are elderly and things of this nature. And the point we make in James chapter 1 and verse 27, and I think this is a valid point, is you cannot fulfill this passage with a check. You, you can't fulfill the, the command here by just donating to a fund that goes out and do this because it says to visit the widows and the orphans in their distress. And that word visit, if you go look it up and you go do some reading on it, it's talking about being active and being involved in their lives. It's talking about, yes, maybe going by and saying hi to them, but it's much more involved in that. It's the idea of caring for them individually, personally. So as you begin to look at this and you begin to think, well, who were widows and orphans in the, in, in the first century? Widows and orphans were, were the neediest of people in society. They were the least capable of caring for themselves in the majority of circumstances, and they were the most in need of help. And so what is James saying here? Well, he's saying pure and undefiled religion leads us to acts of brotherly love. Isn't that what he's talking about here? Recognizing those who are in need and then seeing to it that those needs are met. And then he, he, you know, he doesn't finish there, right? He kind of he kind of loops back to what we and we already noticed this. He kind of loops back to verse 21 to keep oneself unstained by the world. And so there's this need, if, if, if I'm going to be practicing pure and undefiled religion, if I'm going to be demonstrating what the Word would have me to do, then what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to love my neighbor, I'm going to have to love my brothers and sisters in Christ, and that's not just something I say, that's not just a warm feeling, that's me seeing what can I do for them, how can I help them, how can I be of a benefit to them, and then going and doing that work that may be the hardest thing we've noticed in james chapter one huh because that means i've got to give up that one resource that i have in my life that i can't get more of time and that's going to require me to rearrange my schedule and that means i've got to rearrange my priorities and that's exactly i think what james is driving at this is what pure religion does. It puts God and His people first. And brethren, you can't put God first if you don't put His people first. They come together. And so James says, here's, here's what we do. We, we serve God by serving one another. Isn't this exactly what Jesus says over Matthew chapter 25? I know it's a familiar passage, but turn over there with me. Matthew chapter 25, that great judgment scene. And he divides the, the sheep and the goats on his left and his right. Verse 34, he says to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or naked and clothed? you when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you the king will answer and say to them truly i say to you to the extent that you did it to one of these brothers of mine even the least of them you did it to me i heard somebody say the other day if i can get the quote right when you give to the poor you lend to the lord i thought man that's a beautiful concept that's a beautiful concept. How many times have, have I had the opportunity to help someone and maybe I looked at their circumstance and I began to debate the value of helping them. I began to debate whether or not they really needed the help. And I know sometimes we need to ask these questions. But I began to debate with myself all these external things. 
and I, I give myself an excuse not to help because I'm focusing on the person. When in reality, by helping them, I'm serving the Lord. And you know what? Sometimes we get bit. Sometimes we do. But we still serve the Lord. We still serve the Lord. We still demonstrate the heart James is talking about here. We're still doing what we should have been doing, at least in principle. You know, go back over to James chapter 2. I want you to notice he doesn't abandon this as soon as he gets done there in chapter 1. Instead, he continues on with, I think, very a very similar principle, if nothing else. Beginning there in verse 1 of, of, of James chapter 2, My brethren, do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. For if a man comes into your assembly with a gold ring and dressed in fine clothes, and there also comes in a poor man in dirty clothes, and you pay special attention to the one who is wearing the fine clothes, and say, you sit here in a good place, and you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down by my footstool, have you not made distinctions among yourself and become judges with evil motives? Now, he's, he's obviously talking about judging brethren based on externals, but notice he's, he's using the rich and the poor is his illustration. And in the first century, and I, I think we could probably say something similar today, the rich are in the least need of our help and assistance, and the poor are in the greatest need. And what are they doing with the poor man? They're shoving him in the back where they can't see him. Doesn't that violate the principle of James 1, 26 or 27? I, I think that's how he gets there in the context. I, I think that's how he gets there in the context. And then you drop down to verse 14. How does he illustrate faith? What use is it, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but he has no works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace and be warmed and filled, and yet you do not give them what is necessary for that body, for their body, what use is that? Now, I think this is an illustration of what faith looks like in general, but why is he using that illustration in James chapter 2? Because it's the principle he already expressed in James chapter 1 and verse 27. If I fail to do that, if I refuse to do that, then my religion is not pure and undefiled. I'm not serving the Lord as I ought to serve the Lord because I'm not showing the kind of love that he would have me to show. Now this, is, this is so powerful when we begin to think about what he's saying. So many people turn against religion because they think it's this external structure of man-made traditions that are kind of, kind of imprisoning us, if you will, kind of, kind of trying to conform us into the image of those men. And there's certainly instances where we might see that being done in the religious world. No doubt about it. But that's not what James has described, has he? He has, however, described a structure. And it is a structure that is intended to conform us. But it's not some external structure. It's an internal structure. It's a structure that is built around our heart. And it's intended to conform us, not to some man who's seeking to empower himself. No, that's not the idea at all but it's intended to conform us to the very image of God. Isn't that what James is describing there in James chapter 1 and verse 27? What has God done but that? He came and he took care of those who were helpless. How often do you see Jesus described this way in the Gospels? He's looking at the lost house of Israel and he's compassionate upon them. Why? They have a need they cannot fulfill for themselves. They are powerless. And he has the ability. And he works to accomplish that. This structure that James is talking about, this religion that James is talking about, is intended to surround our hearts in order to conform us to the very God that we serve. You know, going back up to James chapter 1, verse 19. This you know, my beloved brethren, but everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger, for the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of of God. The anger he's talking about in this text is a worldly impulse. He describes it in verse 21 as filthiness and wickedness. It is the opposite of humility. What's, what is oftentimes the cure for anger? 
oftentimes, not always, there's legitimate anger. Don't misunderstand. But oftentimes when we've become angered, it's because we're selfish. Oftentimes when we've become ang angered, it's because of pride. Oftentimes it's because someone has said something to us that has kind of inflamed our pride in a very negative way or they've done something and we've, we've decided we're going to take exception to it. And, and again, not every time, but oftentimes for no good reason. For no good reason. It's the very opposite of the humility that James is describing here. As a matter of fact, you go back over there to James chapter 3, and as he talks about this, this wisdom of the world, what is this wisdom of the world? Well, verse 16 is jealousy and selfish ambition. Well, those things will lead to anger. As a matter of fact, he gets right back to it, doesn't he? In chapter 4 and verse 1, what is the source of the quarrels and conflicts among you is not the source your pleasures that wage war in your members. So now we've got lust. Where does that lust come from? Our desires. Why would that cause me to quarrel with someone else? Maybe they're standing in the way of me fulfilling my desire. Who are they to do that? What's the solution for all that? What if we receive the word what if we do the word? And what if we do the law? Because let me, let me tell you what I'm going to find out then. That I'm as, I'm as big a sinner as whoever I'm angry at. And I've wronged the Lord just as much as they have. And I deserve His judgment just as much. That should get rid of my pride, shouldn't it? And then I'm going to do the word. Well, brethren, that, that's going to require me controlling my lust. Whatever that desire is, we use that word lust a lot of times to talk about some sort of sexual immorality. That's not how that word's used all the way in Scripture. It's often this very generic, it's just desire. And so I'm going to I'm gonna have to corral my desires, right? If I'm going to be a doer of the word, I'm going to have to learn to desire those things which God desires, right? So all of a sudden, you can't get in my way. You can't keep me from doing what I want to do. Not if I'm a doer of the word, because you can't stop me from doing that. Now, you might make it a little more difficult in one aspect or another, but you can't stop me from serving the Lord. That's what Paul says. Isn't it? I'm in prison, but it's okay because I'm teaching the gospel to the guards. You can't stop me from being a doer of the word. And then I'm going to be a doer of the law. There go my excuses. I probably shouldn't have acted this way, but how many of you have heard that sentence? How many of us have said that sentence? I shouldn't have done that, but... And you know when you're saying it, everything that comes after those three little letters is an excuse that doesn't justify anything. It's me not doing the law. James says, no, that, that's not pure and undefiled religion. But if I let God's word be what God's word ought to be in my life, it'll shape my thinking. It'll shape my actions. It'll shape my view of my fellow man. It'll bring me closer to God. And that, that is pure and undefiled religion. What a wonderful book James has given us. He, it's so practical, isn't it? I think that's one of the reasons we like to read James and maybe one of the reasons we don't like to read James, right? Because if we feel like we're serving the Lord like we ought, James is a, a very pleasant read. But if we don't, it'll get right in the middle of us, won't it? It'll get right to the heart of the issue, and it'll, it'll drive us either away or toward the Lord, depending on our willingness to receive the Word. If I look out at this audience, I see a group of people that have heard that Word, and no one understand what that Word would have you to do about your sin. So if you're here tonight, and there's sin in your life, will you be a doer of the Word? Will you simply respond to the gospel invitation? Beg for God to do that which God alone can do for you. If we can help you with that or anything else tonight, why don't you let us know while we stand and while we sing.